presents, a gift for the person, but let's not forget that the greatest gift given to man was Jesus. And he wasn't packaged in ribbon. He wasn't packaged in a nice tart in uh, gift wrap. He was gift wrapped in humanity for us. So let's just thank him for that today and don't forget that. Let's not forget, it's been very much commercialized, but we know, those of us of the faith know the real reason to celebrate Christmas this morning. Hallelujah. As we get into the word today, I'm going to divert your attention to 1st of Kings chapter 19, verse 15. Now when you have it, please say amen, and if you don't, just say hold up. Hold up, brother. Hold your horses. Verse the first Kings chapter 19 verse 15. We're going to read 15 to 18. I'm going to give you guys some time to go through your apps, through your Bibles, right? Um, I still got a Bible at home, but most of the time I do it through my app. It's very much more convenient, but there's nothing wrong with still carrying around the Bible, right? Hallelujah. So first of Kings chapter 19 verse 15. The Lord said to him, and he's speaking to Elijah, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel and anoint Elisha son of Saphat from Abel Meholah to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed them. The title of today's message is, It's Time to Go Back. Father, I come before you in this morning, and I thank you for your people, Lord. I thank you for the ability to come before you, not through my own strength and not through my own wisdom, Lord, but by the wisdom provided by your spirit, God. I pray that every mind will be open, Lord. I pray that every mind would focus on the word, Lord, that you would provide for your people today. Make a way, Lord, where there is no way, and bring freedom where there is bondage. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. It's time to go back. Now, as I talk about this Bible verse, I want to divert your attention to some of my favorite movies, and I'll explain why this is relevant. Um, I'm a huge sci-fi person. I love sci-fi, right? I love Star Wars. I love Avatar. I love the Terminator franchise. Um, and one of my favorite uh, sci-fi movies is Frequency. Anybody ever seen the movie Frequency? Okay, right? It stars Dennis Quaid and Jim Caviezel, and I had to look up his name to make sure I, I pronounced it correctly. Um, and it came out in the year 2000, and the premise behind this movie is that on the night in 1999, Jim Caviezel's character, John Sullivan, he's an NYPD detective, and there were some polar lights, the aurora, right, outside, and he's able to communicate with his father 30 years into the past, right? And he uses an old school, what they call a ham radio. I didn't even know what a ham radio was. I had to look it up, right? But he talks to his father, who is a FDNY firefighter. And if you watch this movie, right, it just changes everything about the past, right? He's able to talk to his dad. And one of the things that you realize at the start of this movie, this man is really broken. This man is emotionally shut off. His girlfriend leaves him, right? His life is utterly a mess. And he's able to communicate with his father, who's been deceased now for 30 years. Imagine that if you had the opportunity to get on a radio and talk to someone 30 years into the past. Who would you talk to? That's an interesting question, right? Maybe a family member that has passed away. Maybe a child. Maybe someone else, right? But this movie, for me, produces a lot of emotions because sometimes I, I think about who I would call on the radio. I know for me it would be my mother. That's the person I will call, who's been deceased over 20 years. Um, but... It's an interesting concept to be able to know that. And when we see the movie, right, and they start communicating about the 1969 World Series with the Mets. Now, I'm not going to get into who's Mets fans, who's Yankee fans in here, because I know that's real divisive in this church, right? Um, but I will say that the Knicks are the New York team. I, I'm sorry about the Brooklyn Nets fans out there. I know they're not doing too well right now. I watch every Knicks game, believe me. I I've been following them since 92, so I know how good and how bad they've been playing. But I can tell you that as Jim talks to his father in the past, he's able to rectify things that start to allow him to change in the present. And one of the points of the movie is that the absence of his father has made him a different person. 
And John wants to be able to move forward in his life, but he's not able to because he's still holding on to the past. And I came to tell you that there's things about our past that is holding us from our purposes and our promises in God. And many of us are still carrying a lot of hurt, unresolved issues that is robbing us of peace, of faith, and of health in God. And I can tell you as a psychotherapist, when I work with clients that have experienced trauma, one of the main things when people experience trauma is that they don't want to talk about it. They want to avoid thinking about it. They want to avoid walking around the area where the trauma happened. And let me tell you that one of the things that trauma does is that it is strengthened in avoidance. Right? So when we avoid certain things, when we avoid to talk about our past, when we avoid to talk about our hurt, it just gets stronger and stronger. And the reactions to trauma become stronger as well. Where we start to see PTSD. We start to see anxiety. We start to see depression. Right? So it comes a point where we have to confront this past pain, this past hurt. When we find Elijah in this verse, he is the shell of a man who prayed for fire down on Mount Carmel, the chapter before. How many know that even though we've done great things, that there are times when we can also become discouraged? There's times that we can do great things in God and the next day feel like we failed him. And this is, when we encounter Elijah in this chapter, this is what we're encountering now. Elijah was on a mission. His mission was to eradicate Baal worship, which was the idol worship of Baal in the nation of Israel. And when we look at the verses 1 through 8, we're looking at an Elijah that's not calling down fire from heaven. We're looking at an Elijah that's depressed, that is experiencing suicidal ideation, that is saying, God, I wish you would destroy me and that I would exist no more. But the Bible says that an angel brought him Uber Eats. It doesn't say that, but if he was in our contemporary time, the Bible says that an angel came and delivered food to him. I would like to think it's Chick-fil-A with a peppermint mocha shake. I don't know. I just had that on Friday. Maybe I'm being biased. But the Bible says that God came to minister to him in his physical state where he was broken. And Elijah does a lot of things that people who are depressed, who are clinically depressed do, which is sleep and eat. So when you see your brother and your sister, right? And they're dealing with a depressive episode. Don't say that they're lazy. Don't say that they are just letting go of their weight. What's happening is that these are symptoms that are being manifested of clinical depression. Sometimes it's important to understand the context in which certain things happen. In verse 9, we find Elijah at Horeb. Now, if you know of the story of Moses, you're going to be very familiar with the mountain of Kos Sinai or Horeb, as some historians have said that they're interchangeable. And if you remember, it was at Horeb that God met Moses to give him not only the Ten Commandments, but also the burning bush experience. And when we look at verse 9, if you follow with me, chapter 19, it says, There he came to a cave and spent the night in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? It's interesting because when we see the story of Moses, God meets Moses at the height of the mountain. But now we see the great prophet where? in the cave how many know that god is the god of the mountain the god of the valley but also the god of the cave he is the god that comes and meets us in our lowest point and this was definitely one of the lowest points for elijah i don't know what low point you're dealing with right now but the word of the lord can get to you you may be experiencing your cave moment right now but god has a word for you this morning And verse 10 says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to the death with the sword. I am the one, I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Verse 11 says, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. How many know that after the fire comes the word? That after the tribulation comes the word? That after you've been put through the fire and you've been refined as gold, the word of God can come through more clearly. And some of you know, as I have, you've been put to the test. You've been put to the fire like I have and know that Sometimes it is tough to be able to serve God. But when you allow yourself to be molded by that fire, the word of the God is soon to follow. 
And verse 13 says, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mount of the cave. And then the voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 14 says, he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to the death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. I want you to look at something in your Bible, something interesting. I want you to compare verse 14 and verse 10. Do you notice any similarities? It's the exact same expression. This is interesting because Elijah just saw the manifest glory of God. And yet his response was the same. Is it that Elijah's response is like many Christians in the 21st century that when there's the spirit of God is moving, right? There's people, they got their hands in their pockets. People got their arms crossed. People on TikTok on their phone. I don't know what else they're doing on their phone. Checking their Google calendar. Maybe looking at the scorecard from the, from the game, right? But at this time, Elijah showed a response that many Christians show in a worship service. And people say that the Bible is antiquated. But I wonder if there's a congregation here today that know how to respond to the Holy Spirit. That know that when the Spirit of God is stirring, they don't just stay quiet, but they got to shout. They got to stomp their feet. They got to clap. They got to shout. They got to have some type of response. Or am I talking to a different congregation? Elijah was not moved by the manifestation of God. And the reality is that we will not always be moved by it because we're so burdened down by our own circumstances. Elijah wants to move forward with what God had placed in his hands to do. But he wasn't able to because he was too busy living in the past, too busy living in despair. And God wanted him to revisit his past, but to see it from a different angle. God tells Elijah, it's time to go back in your journey. It's time to go back to the place that you're running from because there's things that are still left unaddressed. And I want to tell you that you're trying, you've been trying to move forward for so many years, but there's things in your life that are still holding you back because you have yet to address them. And there's promises of God that have yet to be fulfilled because you have said no to these areas of your life and said yes to others. God wants us to revisit our past because there are things that we still need to address. In the passage, Elijah was on the run and God said, go back. One of the main things that I want to communicate to you is that going back means confronting what we fear most so that our faith can be renewed. For Elijah, he was running in fear. And it was 40 days prior to when he had the Mount Carmel experience. He was desperate because he saw his nation in decline, in both moral and spiritual decline. But how many know that God have a backup plan? Right? Even if Elijah hadn't done what God had told him, if you look at the verses that we read, it said, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, anoint Elisha, and anoint Hazael. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael. Elijah will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. And guess what? If that fails, I still got seven people ready on my accord to launch and to be ready for whatever I send them to do. So don't ever feel like things don't work out. God has a backup plan of a backup plan of a backup plan of a backup plan. Because guess what? God is never surprised what comes into our life. Elijah was running from his past because there was something he was fearing. Maybe from him it was the fear of failure. Maybe for him it was the fear that God wasn't going to do what he promised. And I don't know what you're running from today. Because how many know that you can run but not really physically be running? That there's things from your past, there's things from your life that you have not addressed that you're running from. And God is telling you, you need to stand still and address this. Right, because we're so easily drawn into TikTok, right? We think life is like TikTok that we could just scroll through videos, right? And see little snippets of laughter, of serious topics, right? But life is not like that. Sometimes we got to actually stop and be self-reflective and look at what we've been through and really allow God to, to tackle those areas about our life that sometimes we hide from him. It is this same mountain that Elijah heard the whisper of God. It's the same place where Moses received the call to be the deliverer. Moses, it's interesting, was also on the run at this point when he was called in the burning bush experience. See, when we get to see Moses and the things he did in Egypt, we know him as Moses the deliverer. But at this point, Moses was known as the murderer. When you turn with me to Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 to 15. 
And we know the story of Moses, of how God had, when he was born, and how the Egyptians family, the Pharaoh's family, found him in the river in a basket. And when we encounter Moses here in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 to 15, Moses has grown up. And Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 says, One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that way, seeing no one was there. He killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And the next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing us as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and, and thought, what? I must, what I did must have become known. And verse 15 says, When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by the well. And it's the chapter after, in chapter 3, where we find Moses encountered the burning bush experience. I came to tell you today that God wants to bring you back to the place of your biggest mistake, because that's where he wants to produce his, his biggest miracle. Moses had to confront his past like many of us are going to have to do. And remember the God of his ancestors. God wants us to stop running from our mistakes and embrace that those are things that have formed our character. That those same areas of weakness and failure that we bring, God will use them to bring himself glory, but also to remind us that in our weakness, he is made strong. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 to 12, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses. I am content with insults. I am content with hardships. I am content with persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So if you find yourself in a moment of weakness, I want to tell you that there's strength in weakness. And it sounds paradoxical. But when we allow and we place our weakness in the hands of God, he can make it into a strength. I don't know what mistake is holding you back today or mistakes. I know for me it's plural. But maybe remorse has kicked in. Maybe you're facing some of the consequences of these bad decisions. It is time to accept the mistakes that we have made and allow God to, to bring his spirit, to bring reconciliation and restoration to our lives. The problem is that we never open that up to God. One of the most painful things that we can encounter in life is betrayal. And betrayal by the ones that we love most and that we trust. And we see this in the life of Jesus as he is handed over, right, to the Pharisees, to the religious leader. He is betrayed by his own disciple. And he is betrayed with a kiss. And yet Jesus teaches us that in the midst of that, we have the opportunity to overcome betrayal with love and forgiveness. And that's why Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know, do not know what they are doing in Luke chapter 23, 34. Jesus was leading the way and showing us the power of forgiveness. The lack of forgiveness is something that can hold us back in so many areas. It's something that we see in the story of Joseph. How many are familiar with the story of Joseph, right? I'm sure of you have heard it so many times in Sunday school. I, I encourage you to reread it. It's such a touching story. And I, I found myself literally sobbing as I studied and I read this story again. And just how this man, Joseph, had gone through so much trauma, through, through so much tragedy, and still had the ability to confront his brothers and ultimately forgive them. Joseph, when he left his brothers, was a kid that was flaunting his multicolored tunic. When his brothers encounter him, he's now a man dressed in fine linen, second in command to the Pharaoh. But how many know that although he appeared like royalty on the outside, something inside of him was still broken? Because sometimes we could look the part, we could look like royalty, but be paupers in the inside. We could be a poverty of spirit on the inside. We could look good and walk around good and dress nice, right? But there's still something broken inside of us. And Joseph confronted his brokenness when he saw his brothers again. And in Genesis chapter 42, his brothers come to Egypt because of a great famine. And Joseph recognizes them, but he treats them as total strangers. And then he accuses them of being spies. 
In verse 21 it says, They said to one another, the brother speaking, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come to us now. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Verse 23 says, They did not realize that Joseph could understand him since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Right? So Joseph was, when he was confronted with his past again, when he was confronted with the tragedy of the betrayal within his own family, because a lot of times, unfortunately, the betrayal doesn't come from strangers. It comes from those that are closest to us. And in the life of Joseph, this is what he had to encounter. And in Genesis chapter 45, he reveals to his brothers who he is, and forgiveness occurs. This allows Joseph not only to be reunited with his brothers, but also his father. He obtained something from Egypt, that he obtained something from that experience that Egypt in all its richness would ever, ever give him. He experienced the fullness of forgiveness and restoration. I came to tell you today that forgiveness of the past is the key to freedom in the present. Who is it that you need to forgive today? One of the things that I have learned is that unfortunately our family is one of the greatest sources of pain and struggle. God wants to bring us freedom, but we got to be willing to forgive. Bob Enright, PhD, a psychologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who oversees the study of forgiveness for over 30 years, states that true forgiveness goes a step further. He says, more than just offering something positive, or more than just letting it go, like some people say, but offering something positive, something empathic, compassion, understanding towards the person who hurt you. This is very much in line with the, the, the way that the Bible looks at forgiveness, right? A lot of times we think of forgiveness about letting go. But when this psychologist operationalizes and defines forgiveness, it's more in line with what the Bible says, right? That it's not just letting go, but it's also having empathy, compassion, understanding toward the person that hurt you. And this is what Joseph experienced. This is the forgiveness that Jesus talks about time and time again in the New Testament. In a 2005 book titled Forgiveness and Health, written by three psychologists, Toussaint, Worthington, David R. Williams, reports the physical and psychological benefits of forgiveness. Worthington states that people of religious faith are in a better position to forgive. How many of y'all know that that's true? He states all of the major religions value forgiveness. Forgiveness has been linked with a reduction in anxiety, depression, stress, anger, as well as heart issues like heart disease. Toussaint says in reference to stress, forgiveness allows you to let go of chronic interpersonal stressors that are causing you undue burden. Now, I don't come and stand here and say that forgiveness is easy because it is not. And it won't happen immediately. But I know that if you give it into the hands of God, he will empower you to do the impossible. He will empower you to forgive the unforgivable. He will empower you to heal in those areas of life where you believe that it can't be healed. And let me tell you something. There's a lack of forgiveness that people have been carrying for 30, 40 years. The people that they actually feel hatred to and feel a despise for are probably not even living anymore. But yet those individuals are still holding on. And it is hard to enjoy the promises and the blessings of God when we're still holding on to old stuff. God brings us back to a place in our life like he did with Elijah that still needs healing and closure. He needs to bring us to a place where we can see that these things need to be addressed. And I hope that it is something that is becoming clear that it is imperative that you take care of these things. There are things that have been holding you back for too long that you've been crying out and praying, God, when will things change? And I believe that in order for you to move forward, there are things in the past that you need to address. It's interesting because in that moment of vulnerability when we encounter Elijah, right, in chapter 15, the great prophet, when he's depressed, when he's suicidal, when he's hopeless, you know, God didn't say, hey, man, you're a prophet, get it together, Right? God didn't say, it's your own fault that you're like this. You don't have enough faith, Elijah. Or maybe you kind of are not the best prophet. Maybe I should have called somebody else. And sometimes our own brothers and sisters meet us with that type of criticism. 
And it's interesting that God didn't approach Elijah to discipline him, but actually responded to him in compassion, right? And this is where we see the true mercy and compassion of God, right? That even when he passes by, that he manifests his glory, and he sees that Elijah's reaction is the same. It hasn't changed. He still says, I need you to still get up because there's still a mission that you got to do. And there's a mission and there's a purpose that many of you have been invested with, and you're not able to move forward because these are things that keep holding you back. God was good to Elijah. And one of the things that we sometimes forget is how good our God is. We forget about the goodness of God when we start to deal with a lot of the difficult pain and struggle and tragedy that we deal with in our life. Right? And I came to tell you today and I came to remind you that God is still good. In the midst of the turmoil, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the tragedy... God wants to remind you today. He wants to bring you back in your journey and remind you of his goodness, of his greatness, of his mercy, of his grace today. The last point that I want to share with you today is that God wants to bring you back to remind you of all his goodness. Because you should never forget that our God is good. And I'm not saying that you're going to feel good all the time, but God is going to be good all the time. I'm not saying that emotionally you're going to feel like going to church, but God is going to be good in the midst of that situation as well. And I want to read to you as we prepare. I'm going to ask Matt to come up, please. I want to read for you a psalm from the psalmist David. And I love the psalms, but this one was so impactful. It's Psalms 145. And I want to read it to you, the whole verse. It's about 15. Uh, 21 verses, because I want you to hear what the psalmist says in this moment. I want you to feel what the psalmist is trying to communicate. And if I had to summarize this verse, this chapter, I would say that it is a reflection of the goodness of God. And I want you to follow with me. So I'm going to give you a chance to get to Psalms 145. Psalms 145, written by the great Levite and King David. And when you have it, say amen. I'm going to take you back on a journey. Because there's something that is telling me it is the Holy Spirit. That there are people that have forgotten how good our God is. They have, forget about, they have forgotten about the goodness of God. And there's something to understand and know that God is faithful. But there's another thing to know that he is good. He is good. And I want you to follow with me in Psalms 145. Now, I want you to really, if there's anything that you focus on today, I want you to focus on this. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works, I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly and utterly and utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power, to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom, because your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all the generations. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them food in their due time. You open up your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and he will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. And verse 21 says, My mouth will speak the praises of the Lord, and all the flesh, and all my flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. How many can thank God for his goodness? Maybe you've forgotten how good God is. 
and the psalmist is here to tell you he is good I know that when life comes our way and when trial and tribulation comes our way things don't look so good we forget about the goodness of God we forget about the purposes and the promises that God has called us forth but I want to tell you that today there's a promise for your life there's a purpose that God wants to fulfill and I can tell you that I've had to go on this journey myself go into my past go into my childhood to confront the man that I had become it wasn't the person that I wanted to be and I remember my past and I've been through a lot of difficult things and it's not to be victimized to present myself as a victim or to generate pity but to say that God has been good in my life and I can tell you that in those moments that I struggled that I felt that I was losing faith God told me right as I entered adulthood that there was things that I needed to go back and address in childhood and adolescence and early adulthood right as I got older there was things that God kept telling me you have to address you have to address and I just I was ignoring what God was telling me because I didn't feel like I had the courage enough to do it and there was moments where I dealt with a lot of anxiety with a lot of panic attacks um, and it did all this really started to happen a year after my mother passed away I started to experience severe anxiety to the point where I would fall into a stupor into a catatonic stupor and just repeat and repeat and repeat and I remember my father yelling at me to try to get me out of the stupor and, and nothing would help and I would see him at five in the morning praying when I would wake up because I really couldn't sleep during that time and I just want to honor <clears throat> my brother Sam I know he's not here today his wife is here me and Sam Noyola, uh, we used to work in youth ministry back in the day. We used to go out into the trains to preach. We used to do a lot of crazy things um, together for the Lord, of course. Uh, he introduced me to West Indian food, to roti, to some curry chicken, some rice. Right. And I remember that in those moments of panic, in those moments of anxiety, I called Sam at four in the morning and he picked up. And I said, brother, I can't sleep just dealing with a lot of anxiety can you pray with me and he prayed with me and I just want to honor Sam and I know he's not here today but I want you to communicate to him that God still has a plan for his life not to forget that he's been called to preach that he's been called to proclaim his word and I will never forget how that brother was there for me in that moment of weakness and I want to tell you that today no matter what you go through I've been through a lot but I'm grateful that I'm standing because I have not forgotten the goodness of God right and I look towards the future with hope because I know that he is good and I know where God has lifted me from and I'm gonna go a little old school because that's just the way I am um, and one of the songs that ministered to me for so many years is when I think about the Lord and I want you to sort to join me in this song because I want you to remember all that God has brought you through and maybe you think he hasn't brought you through enough but I want to tell you that there's moments in your life that you wouldn't have made it unless he had sustained you I want to tell you that if you allow unforgiveness to set in your heart for years, it will bring destruction to your purpose and to the promises that God has for you. It's time to start releasing some of that unforgiveness. It's time to start releasing that fear. It's time to start releasing these things that have been holding you back, that have been a burden in your life. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I know that the Holy Spirit is going to bring some things to remembrance. But I want you to, as you hear the song, that you would remember who God is. That as you reflect on his goodness, that you would remember that he is still working. He is still the God of the mountains. He is still the God of the valley. And for me, he was the God of the cave when I was in the cave. I encourage you to be courageous. Because God is here and he wants to heal you from your trauma. He wants to heal you from your tragedy. He wants to heal you from the hurt and pain. I know there's people in here that are still carrying things from an old church that they've been hurt from. There's people that were in church, that were in ministry, that they say, I don't want to ever serve in ministry again. I never want to sing. I never want to preach. I never want to disciple. I never want to do anything related to church because they were hurt in the church that we're in before. I want to tell you that God is here to heal you. And I want to tell you that as church members, as church folk, we're going to make mistakes. And it, th that's not excusable. But I want to tell you that the God, the true God of love and restoration is here. And maybe you are carrying the hurts of a former church, of a former relationship. God is here to tell you that he wants to heal you and make you whole. So that you can be able to move forward with whatever God has for you. 
So as you reflect on this word, I want to encourage you. If you feel you need prayer, we're here to pray with you. I believe that your past doesn't have to be your future. I believe that your past doesn't have to be your present, right? That you don't have to live in the past anymore, carrying all this burden, but that God has called you to release it onto him and he will bring freedom and he will bring healing and he will bring restoration. How many believe it? I'm going to ask you to stand up on your feet. Jesus, we thank you. There's so many things that happen in our life, God, as we look back and we reflect, Lord. And sometimes life gets so busy that we forget the things we go through. And we try to distract ourselves. We try to be so busy that we don't address the things that God wants us to address. But it's time to stop running like Elijah did. And it's time to confront the things that God wants us to confront. Father, in this moment, I pray for your people. I thank you for the courage that they're going to have to confront these things, Lord. The lack of forgiveness, Lord. The lack of faith and fear, Lord. Lord, and those that have forgotten about your goodness, Lord, that they would be reminded of who you are today, Father. Though, Lord, as those that come up front, Lord, and I invite you to come up front because we want to pray for you. We want you to be healed. And I'm not saying that that's all going to happen right now, but it's going to be a process that will be started today. And he will start that process. And because he starts it, he's going to finish. He will bring all things to completion. Father, right now I pray for every person in this place. No matter what they've gone through. No matter if they've come from another country. They immigrated, Lord. And they struggled, Lord, to get here. Whether they came, Lord, from, from poverty, Lord. And a low-income background, Father. Whether they came from the hood or from the rough neighborhood. Lord, it doesn't matter where we come from, Lord. It matters where you're taking us. So, Father, in this moment, I pray for their lives, that they would surrender all their past hurts, all their past traumas, all their past issues, Lord, and bring it on to you, Father, so that you can bring completeness and wholeness and healing, Lord. I ask you right now, as the worship team sings this song, Lord, that people would be, Lord, inclined to listen to the word that has been shared today, Lord, and that this heart would be impressed, this word would be impressed in their heart, not just in their minds, but in their hearts. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, And turn me around How he placed my feet On solid ground It makes me want to shout Hallelujah Thank you Jesus Lord you're worthy Of all the glory And all Yeah.
how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy yes, Lord, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about, when I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet. continue to do for you oh we thank God we thank God we thank God can we thank the Lord for our friend and awesome speaker Emmanuel Rosales we pray blessings upon your life my brother we pray blessings for his wife and for his two sons we thank God for them amen hallelujah praise God God is good Amen. Take this word home with you. Let it resonate during the week with you. Don't forget it. Go on the podcast if you have to and listen to it over and over again. Amen. Because Manny said something very important. God can't do the work that he wants to do in you if you can't forgive. So search your heart today. That'll be a wonderful way to start the new year, huh? clean pure no burdens no worries no no nothing ready for God to do what he has to do in your life amen praise Jesus hallelujah amen so we thank God this morning for this word amen and we just want to remind you that before we leave so today we uh we just want to remind the church we're getting ready for our family camp amen and we are just so excited but there's a couple of things that you need to get done by today amen so uh if you're going to family camp and you have a sweatshirt that you want to wear to family camp all right you need to go and register online the same way you're doing your payments online please go to our website elohimchristianchurch.org amen and go to events and um on events it's not going to say sweatshirts you know our pastor he's so clever he wants to be all mysterious he put it under ecc roll call because at camp i think we're going to have a roll call right pastor george amen so um if I spoke too fast and you didn't get the instructions, I'll stay here a little bit. Pastor George knows the information too. We'll just give it, repeat it to you. Um, but on ECC roll call, that's where you can go and order your sweatshirts. Amen. Praise the Lord. And those of you who are ready to start the new year and get your baptism classes on, all right, please see Pastor Hector Hernandez. Um, he's around somewhere in the church. I think they're ministering to the youth today. Um, please make sure you signed up for, for those classes. Amen. Amen. How many couples do we have in the house? Where are the couples? Married couples? Come on. Where you at? All right. Well, guess what? You need to see Sister Frances because next Sunday, where's Frances? Next Sunday, right? No, two Sundays from now, the 19th, we're going bowling. Ladies, let's get our swing ready. 
because we're going to knock these men out the park. Yes, amen. All right, we got a couple's bowling going on. Okay, so you're going to see Pastor, um, oh, sorry. You're going to see um, Francis outside, <laughs> outside at the pastor um, at a table, all right? And um, come on, let's go bowling, all right? We haven't had a couple's outing in a minute, so let's go and let's go out there. And if again, if you're interested with the sweatshirts, please see the table that's outside. There's also family camp registration. It's ongoing online. But if you need to speak to someone directly, you're going to have to wait till the new year. Uh, Sister Elise will be with us in January. Amen? Amen. So um, before we end, I know that you're all missing pastor, right? It's something when he's not here, right? When you don't see him right there in the front. But you know what? He has, um, he's gone and spent some time with his dad and his mom. His dad fell a little ill, but he's okay. Amen? So this week, uh, he's worshiping. Eden told me he's worshiping. Pastor is in church with his parents right now and he's worshiping. So God is good. Amen. And um, so pray continuous prayers for the pastor's family. Amen. And that he returned back to us home safely. Amen. So church, how many of you appreciate our ushers in the church? Amen. They work so hard. Amen. And we also want to honor our security team. You know, when we're in church, we got those men and women out, outside, and they're watching our cars, they're watching the vehicles. We have an awesome security system now in the church where they're watching cameras, and we appreciate them. But um, as things in this church go, right, when the church blesses people and they keep growing, God just says, okay, it's time for you to move on. And they just, they don't remain here, right? We, we mold people, we grow people, and we send them out. And um, Peter today has someone that he's going to be sending out today. So uh, just bear with us a few more minutes. God bless you, church. Um, I'd like to call Brother Ephraim, usher here, to the uh, altar, please. And also Brother Leo Nieves. Um, they'll both be leaving uh, prospectively different places. Um, please come up, brother. On behalf of Elohim, we want to give you this thank you card from our part. Um, I also want to give this to Leo. Leo is one of my number one guys. Um, you guys know that um, part of the Elohim security team, you know, it's, it's a task that we're, we're given, and Leo always steps up to the board. You know, you'll see him. He's there for you. He's um, given his time, the same as Ephraim. They're giving their time here in the church, and we want to make sure we recognize them, and we say, you know, not just goodbye, but see you again. Um, when you're part of ECC family, you're always part of ECC family. So um, thank you. I hope in your new church, at your new place, you find a home that's just like his, and if not, you can always log online and see us. So <laughs> God bless you. I want to read this here real fast. Uh, a certificate of appreciation to Leo Nieves for going above and beyond volunteering your services and for the betterment of our church community, Elohim Christian Church, for over five years. Thank you. Give it to, to God, give it a good, good measure, press down, shake it together, run it over, and pour it onto you. For with the measure, with, with the measure you use, it will, you will be measured. Luke 6, 38. God bless you, my brother. Thank you, my brother. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Leo and Ephraim, can you just stay right here in the front? We're gonna, we're, we want to um, make sure that you leave with a pastoral prayer over you. Amen. And as they pray for them, let's all extend our hands and let's lift up the name of Jesus. And we thank God this morning. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father God, for each and every person that came, Lord God, to meet with you here today. We thank you, Lord God, for Pastor George's family, Lord God, who has honored us with their presence here today. We thank you for Lucas. We pray blessings upon this young baby's life, Lord God. We thank you for the message that was poured into us today, Lord God. Father, help us today, Lord God, from now on, Lord God, to find forgiveness, Lord God, to recognize, Lord God, that you are more important, Lord God, than grudges. So, Father, help your people be released and liberated from that. And, Father, we pray for your two servants, Lord Jesus, that as they go, Lord God, into their new journeys, Lord Jesus, we pray a hedge of protection over them, Lord God, and that you, Father God, may just make your plan for them, Lord God, real, and that they may have it clear, Lord Jesus. Father, I give you, you every family that is in this house right now, Jesus. 
as they go to their destinations today, Lord God, that you may protect them, Lord Jesus, that you may bless their weak, O God, and that you may bless their homes, Lord Jesus, and that they, Lord God, may have this message resonating with them all week, Lord Jesus, and that we may be together here Tuesday night in prayer, Lord Jesus, that we may meet Friday night, Lord God, and that we come together again on Sunday, Lord Jesus, to worship you, God. We thank you for our church. We thank you for our pastor and for the miracle healing hand that you have placed over his father, God. And we thank you, Jesus, and let the church say, Amen. Amen. Greet each other in the name of Jesus. God bless you all.